Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar, Mixing the Main Stage, presented by Raphael Williams and Ed Jackson. My name is Laura Lawrence and I'm the Global Marketing Director at Harman. Just a few things before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep down noise levels during the webinar. However, there is a Q&A function where you can submit questions to the presenters and they'll try to answer as many questions as possible. The webinar is being recorded and the link will be made available a few days after this presentation. We do have a number of other webinars taking place over the next few months for audio, lighting, video, and control, and we'd like to encourage you to take a look at the different webinars in our Learning Sessions Workshop Series on pro.harman.com. We're adding new sessions daily, and we have over 20 sessions scheduled for August and September, so watch for those on the calendar. And now I'd like to introduce you to Raphael Williams and Ed Jackson, the presenters for today's webinar. Raphael is a world-renowned sound engineer that has worked on some of the world's biggest stages with internationally recognized artists. His value of integrity, professionalism, and excellence have made him one of the most sought after engineers in the field. Ed Jackson has worked for Harman since 2013, specializing in JBL VTX systems and Soundcraft consoles. Before Harman, Ed worked as UK National Technical Lead for the Academy Music Group and Live Nation, designing and managing venues and working on shows including Eminem, Kiss, and The Prodigy. Now I'll pass it over to you, Ed. All right, well, thank you very much, Laura, uh, for that introduction. And thank you, Raf, for spending the time talking to this. I've been looking forward to this. So, first of all, how are you doing? You okay? I am good, thank you. Good um, and all. Right. Um, all comfortable. And, yes, you've got quite a big crowd, so you're obviously the, the main draw today. So, yes, it's, it's all about you. No now, pleasure. I'll... Yeah, no pressure. Um, I'll, I'll just warn everyone that we are, we're improvising this. We've got a bit of a script, but we're obviously going to be winging it a little bit as well. Um, and in fact, we only rehearsed the first question, but the answer was so good that I just wanted to, um, you know, sort of like make sure that we, we kept that spirit of freshness. So how did you start off working in the audio industry, Raf? Uh, I started in church. And uh -huh. I wouldn't really call it audio engineering. Um, I always sat around my godfather, my cousins and stuff like that in church playing music. Um, then my dad started um, a church where he got some musical uh, equipment and some PA stuff, which was generically combo speakers and a few things like that. And he used to go, Raph, help me fix this up together. And I was about seven years old. And okay. he would always go, oh, I don't know how to do this. Can you do this? I went, Dad, move out the way. Let yeah. me do this for you. And then we, we, I progressed and just looked at that type of equipment. Um, sometimes I did break it because I realistically didn't know what I was doing with it. Um, and then sometimes we, um, I was the main, call it, sound person at that time. Um, and so what sort of age were you when you were the main sound person? I was running around with... with speaker cables at the age seven seven to ten that's um, amazing I, I was the the main sound person um when we had little church conferences and stuff like that um and then a uh, little fast tracking on is we was doing youth clubs uh, in the community uh and we got some funding for some studio equipment um and we had like a pro tools rig and my dad well we used to record a lot of the my peers i could say not even people younger than me or older than me basically uh -huh. people my, my, my age recorded in a in a booth and doing little mcs and recording different music and then putting it out there and then one day my dad goes oh you're gonna do a live recording in our church service i was like sorry i was like you're gonna do a live recording with all this equipment i'm like i don't know how to do that so at the age of 14 uh, at age of 14, 15, uh, I ended up packing the whole studio down, taking it to this church, setting it up, put some ambient microphones everywhere, and micing up the drums, which was never mic'd up before, and keyboards uh -huh. and everything like that, recording it, taking it back to the studio, mixing it, and producing a little um, CD. And I was like, okay, I've, I've got something here. Oh, to be able to do that at such a young age, and can you remember what it was that you were recording onto? Can you remember the format uh, was, of that first was, uh, show? I had a um, G5, so it was called, uh, yeah. Apple Mac G5 Tower, uh, using a 002 um, Digirack, yeah. um, which had 
uh, four XLR inputs in, and then we had a M Audio um, uh, Opti Opti OptiCore, which was like an uh, analog to digital converter, which did it on ADAT, which gave me an extra eight um, lines. So I had 12 lines to record this full service, multi tracks and everything. Um, and I think I did pretty well with it, um, even to the point of like my cousin's uh, big bass players. And he went, you know, you're using big man things there. You're using big man things. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know. So it, it's to the point of like my, my, what I've learned is there's times in your life that you need to put your blinkers on and there's yeah. times in your life that you need to take the blinkers off. Um, so it, at that point I put the blinkers on in terms of being focused and knowing yeah. what I want to do with stuff. Um, and then taking the blinkers off in learning how to use this equipment in the vicinity that all the areas that I needed to use it in, um, which was church at that time. And then I, I ran about the same time, like age 15 or so, I, my cousin was going to college and um doing a music course and i asked can i can i come and sit in with you and the tutor allowed me to come in every week it was like every tuesday coming in at seven o'clock um and sitting in there for an hour i practically did the course um mm -hmm. and did all the mixing sessions re re around that um and then i also did the exam and then from that exam um i think i got the i got the highest in the class i think i, I passed the exam and I got the highest in the class, but the tutor says, even though you got the highest, you can never get any recognition for this because you're too young to enroll onto the course. I was like, oh, that's not good then, is it? So, and uh, if you, um, just as a point, have you still not got the final certificate from that course? <laughs> not, that, <laughs> not that course. No, yeah. no, nah, nah, I, don't, I don't have that recognition for that course. Only, okay, only experience and like, but that's, that's the thing that you need to get the experience. Yeah. Uh, so that that was a good thing having the experience and then um moving on from uh moving on from my dad's local church um doing small little recordings to then go into a college course that i would, could never get recognition for uh i went to college to do music tech um and realistically i'm not a music tech person when i realized i'm more of a background person not person that uh -huh. makes music um, and then I end up going to a venue in Birmingham called Bethel Convention Center. Um, and I watch my cousin, which is Nicoma, uh, manage uh -huh. that venue and engineer it and stuff. And there was an event that he was doing and he was the photographer and he was the engineer. And straight after the concert, he went and did photography and he asked me to come and no, he went and did photography and I went, so who else is going to pack up? No one's packing up. So I just started packing up the cables, doing the mic stands and all the rest of it. And at the end of it, he goes, oh, thanks. I, you didn't need to do that. I was like, well, you look like you needed help, so let me help you. Um, and he goes, what are you doing next week? And I'm like, nothing. I was like, oh, do you want to come and work here for a bit? And I was like, okay. So I end up traveling to Birmingham ever so often to do different functions. Um, and in, in the and so just to put that in perspective, and I've been to the Bethel Convention Center, and it's a big well-equipped venue and it's a yeah, large it's, it's, audience. It's a, it's a two and a half, two and a half thousand seater venue, um, which they had um, at that time, the modern day analog consoles, 48 yeah. channels, um, stage boxes everywhere, PA system ar array around the room. And yeah, yeah, this idea that churches are working to a, a high level of production that you're able to learn on. Yeah, churches, for me, church was my foundation. So church uh -huh. gave me the ability to, to have a good foundation and ability to start from somewhere. Uh, because the mentality from the church that I grew up in is they wanted a high level result at a, at a zero budget. <laughs> I think that's the same in most production systems. No, no, no. It's not, it's, it can't be the same because like, even, even in the industry that we're in now, we have... To say the budget is 10%. Uh -huh. You can still do something with 10%, but churches have 0% and you still have to make something happen. So yeah. it, it's, um, and, and being around that environment gave you problems and gave you solutions at the same time because 
you was able to work with not so good equipment and not so good of a budget, but still make things happen to get the result. And um, sometimes actually having to work with those limitations and some of those limitations of equipment teaches you to be a better engineer. I think it's quite good to have that experience it, at the start. It, it gives you so much shape and so much um, width and depth about you because, yeah. because you don't have everything on a plate. When there is a true problem, you're able to deal with that problem. Yeah, that's um, where you, you learn and it's, yeah. like you say, sort of a good foundation. Most definitely, because you, you can, you can, and I'm not saying this is wrong, like learn the theory about any subject that you're dealing with. But when you get the understanding of the practical, then the theory makes more sense. Um, and, 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 that, and that's, just, that's just how I've worked, that I've always known the practical. And my dad always used to say, oh, go and do, um, go and do, go and go to college, go to university and learn the theory. And I was like, oh, what's the point? What's the point? And it's not until I did both that it made sense and gelled together. So it complemented each other. Um, and, and, and especially like being around church arena, I always put myself around, I could call it seasoned people. Yeah. Uh, and those seasoned people, I, I used to sit next to, um, a monitor engineer that I, um, always, okay, I'm glad you said this cause this is where I wanted to go, but yeah, carry on uh, with the monitor. So I always sat down next to this monitor engineer that I always just watch. He had a, he had a 48 channel desk eight auxiliaries and he used to mix the band vocals choir and everything all on wedges and i used to just watch him and go oh is that what you're doing i just observed everything that he, he was doing um and took it in my stride and then as time got on i was able to support and now touch be able to be able to touch some knobs and turn some auxiliary buttons and start mixing certain things um drawing services um, so that that shaped me to be a monitor engineer, um, and I think that you know to be able to have the experience that early on as to the fact that there is a job of a monitor engineer is something yeah. that you know a large amount of the general public wouldn't be so aware of. And when you're talking about learning the theory and that practical aspect of it, you know there's a lot taught about engineering and studio techniques. There's quite a lot of that that then applies to being a front house engineer but the yeah. skills that you need as a monitor engineer are possibly less documented now it when i first met you you were a monitor engineer so it's something mm -hmm. that you're you know you've you've made a good career on so what what comments would you say about you know those differences that you need to have when you're approaching a monitor desk well okay my 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 journey through monitor engineering is before i even touch the desk Mm -hmm. I need to understand the personalities of the people that I'm working with. So when you understand their personality and their dynamics of how they work, whether it's in-ears or wedges, mm -hmm. then you can approach the console in a way to deliver the result that they require. Um, so, and I, learned, I had to learn that very quickly because uh, a story that I, I tell a few times is, uh, my, I, I think I got called to do Tiny Temper in 2010 when I fin finished university. Yeah. And I was like, Tiny who? And then I ended up going to Music Bank, sitting in the rehearsal room, and um, I had to do triggers. So I had to turn the click channel on every time he needed a certain cue in his music. And I'm at this point, I didn't know that was a role of a, of a monitor engineer. I didn't know, I didn't know it was a role in the first place, yeah. but it's a thing that I had to do. So I progressively, I made a mistake in rehearsals, but on the show, I managed to get it correct. So that was one show that was great on Big Weekend. And I, I did that. I think I did that respectively. And then it got to Glastonbury and I was using a desk that I didn't understand and I didn't know, and I didn't program. And so, sorry, this is Glastonbury with Tiny is, Temper. Yeah, Tiny Temper 2010. Yeah, okay. And and it was uh, the worst show in the world. <laughs> 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 I, 
I, I, I, I, I, we've I, all had those. I, I thought I was going to get fired after that day, but I'm glad the people that are around me believed in my gift, um, yeah. and gave me a second chance. And to the point of, I said, after that day, I am not using or being around any equipment that I don't understand or get. So okay. I need to use everything and understand everything. And, uh, and then also being a monitor engineer, you have to show confidence to the people that are around you that you have control of your environment. And that's just not in a mixing terms. That is the people that are around you, the musicians, the technicians, and even from a festival point of view, you're a guest engineer. So as the house engineers and house crew are there, they need to believe that you've got control of your environment. You, you've got a lot of people looking at you when you're, you, you're in an engineering position like that. And certainly as a monitor engineer on the bigger festivals, the front of house engineer has now disappeared out of eye line and eye contact. Oh, the, the band members, if, they're, if they've got a problem, they're going to be looking at you. Most definitely. Um, and, and even if you, <laughs> e- e- even if you don't know what you're doing, you sort of have to look like you are doing, and Most sometimes definitely. that's enough. Yeah. Yeah. And and the thing is, I I, I learned that I it wasn't that I never had the ability to do what I was doing. I just never knew how to um, place myself and 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 put my quality control in the environment that I was doing it in. So. I, I never um, did checks and did make sure that that person was cool. But now I have to make sure that every single chain of the command or system, I know what it is, how it's connected. So then when, the, when there is a problem, um, the, my artist that I'm working with yeah. asks me a question, I have an answer for that. So, and that's what I've taken from my early days understand your system that you're that you're that's around you and no even though i may just be the monitor engineer i need to understand the rf and even yeah. though i'm just a monitor engineer i need to understand how the back line is connected and how that's wired up and so, understand the electricity that they're going to be supplying exactly and me. understand where the lighting is so that you but, keep out of its way etc and the haze the haze machine yeah. always happened to be on monitor world but mm. <laughs> it, it, it was just understanding and, and working in the environment to get the best result for the artist that I was working for. Um, so, and, and even everything that I'm saying is before I even touched the console. That's the thing. We've not even spoken about any engineering <laughs> techniques. I mean, that, that relationship thing, certainly monitor position has got that a lot because you've got the relationship with the artists and then also the relationship, as you said, with the other people that are on stage and the stage crew and some of them aren't going to be part of your touring party. And you need to get, you know, I mean, within the first five minutes of you introducing yourself to that stage, it's like that sort of sets the tone for the rest of the day. Most so definitely. you need to get that five minutes so that it's good. Yes, um, most, most definitely. And, and, and that is the most important part. And I'm not here to even try and fake it either. So if I'm going to be able, if I'm going to do something, um, I'm going to try and do it properly. And even to the point, like, I, I'm, when I was working in 2010, I'm like 21. So yeah. I, once again, I am the youngest on the stage. And me dictating, me controlling, I could call my older peers, um, seems crazy. Um, but I had to, even to my, my band members that I had at the time, every single one of them were older than me were more mature, well, you could call them more mature than me, but they were my children. <laughs> and and I, I had to baby them. I had to feed them in terms of deliver what they needed in terms of their instrumental. And I also needed to manage their surroundings, make sure it was provided, make sure it was safe, make sure stage entrance was clear and all cables were managed because if anything happened, it would come back around to me. And also, as a monitor engineer, you are the central, if we talk about networks here, we are, monitor engineer is the central hub to the network because everything comes into the line system by the monitor person, 
and front of house is blind technically without the monitor person. So even when show starts, that's the first point of communication that you need to have with your front of house engineer. And it's those bits like letting the front of house engineer know that a different mic has been used exactly. or the snare drum has fallen over or something like that. And yeah, so so it, it's like you, you technically got, you need to have your eyes on your artists, listen to what the artist is doing, have your eyes on the musicians, listen to what those musicians are doing and also be able to keep calm all at the same time and <laughs> communicate to your front of house or your tech person if, you, if you've if you got the ability to have a tech person or be able to manage the whole stage in your lonesome. But at not one point ever are you allowed to show that unstableness to the artist or the stage. But well, because, right yeah, time, when it, that it just falls through, apart. Yeah, yeah. That, that by the time that show finishes, the artist has got to go, oh, that was an amazing show. But at the end of it, you're like, oh, my gosh. Ooh, well, that's, that's that the one. thing. It's like not only have you got to do all of the things that you've just spoken about, you've also got to be doing eight individual mixes for eight individual individuals at the same time. And, and they all have pers- different personalities. Yeah. So it's like um, you've got to okay, listen. Okay, so... You know, we've spoken about a lot of the, you know, the important personal characteristics of monitors. And before we just move on a little bit, have you got any, you know, in terms of providing individual mixes for people, have you got anything that you've learned for the way that different musicians need certain things or how you have worked with them on this mix is right for this person, but this mix is right for another person? Yeah. So with each of my, the musicians that I work with, I could, tell you by percentage how their mix can come come together yeah. um, and um and to the point i can look into the, that musician or artist's face and go you like it this way and you like your vocal at a hundred percent but you like the bvs at 50 percent and the music at 30 percent and the band just hovering around you um, but then the drummer now, he likes to hear his drum kit and the bass sit together. Um, but then the keyboard, he likes to he likes to feel the warmth of the keyboard. So mm-hmm. you don't want to hear it tinky tinky. He wants to feel the warmth of the keyboard. And as, especially with the, the drummers that I've worked with sometimes, I always get, okay, the drummer, the, I would always get boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Boom, boom, boom. You Okay. Boom, boom, boom. And I'm supposed to interpret what that means. <laughs> so yeah. it's like, do you want more of that? Do you want it, the dynamics to change a little bit? And it would be, um, I just want some warmth. So sometimes like when we do drum kits, we have an in kick and we have an out kick. Um, and even though the in kick is, is a beautiful um, microphone and it's warm and it's punchy, um, and from a front of house point of view, it gives you a lot of weight. Um, but from an in ears point of view, the out kit gives you the the warmth. And, and and some drummers don't like the clickiness, but they want the the, yeah. the weight of it. So it's knowing which microphone you use to apply the result that you need to get without having to use crazy EQing. So it's just using the right source of microphone, a little bit of EQ and compression and then delivering that to the musician um and yeah there's a couple of things like where some musicians will actually be quite happy to hear what they're playing with a bit of compression on it because it makes them feel more confident and then some people completely don't want any compression at all because they can tell that it's not exactly what they're playing and so understand but some musicians aren't necessarily great at communicating which one they want. So you have to unpick all of that as well. Most definitely. You, you technically have to be their interpreter for them. Um, and even down to, because you're on a big stage or a small stage or a noisy stage, half the time they're um, playing and can't really express themselves. Mm. So they just show you a face and then you have to translate what that face means. Um, so then we, we now start inheriting talkback systems but, yeah. um, to, for communication. 
but even still you still have to translate the language that they speak um uh, it's cloudy it's muddy it's muggy or uh, don't sound right or uh, the big thing quite one, often don't sound don't right is anything. what you get yeah i don't hear anything i'm like do you hear me he went yes yeah. so, okay so you hear something <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it, it's just understanding and and that's why i call them my children because you have to treat them and guide them through a process like you do with a child like they may w- know what they want but don't know how to get what they need yeah certainly you have to ask them questions that make it easy for them to give you the right answers most definitely yeah most definitely. um and just two other things quickly um and one thing that i learned about monitors which has always helped me when i'm doing it is that there was a study done oh god about 25 years ago 30 years ago in germany and what that idea was that if someone is making a noise themselves it will always seem a little bit quieter to them than it will Mm -hmm. someone else Mm -hmm. so if you're actually doing the action that makes a noise it will always come across as just that bit quieter so then as a monitor engineer when you're making a judgment on right the drummer's asked for this man that sounds really loud it's going to sound quieter to him so you actually need to tweak it that little bit more for him and that's usually when you see them smiling Yes, most definitely. And, and they think, the thing I like about monitors or the thing that I do in monitors is I don't like or I never allow my artists, technically sometimes musicians, but technically my artists, I'll never allow them to touch a microphone before I know what they're going to be hearing. So I know what their mixes are going to be like uh-huh. And I know what their microphone deliverance is going to be before they touch it. So right, okay. My aim is for that artist, that person, to speak, sing on the microphone and go, thank you very much. Or if there is any changes, it's little changes. And I, growing up, I've, I've seen artists, people walking, up, walking on the stage and nothing's been set. And it's like, why would you allow that to happen? If, you, if you're with an artist and you've not prepared your station for that artist or that yeah. person, then you're not doing your job correctly. Well, certainly as a, I, when I was learning as a monitor engineer, so similar sort of age to you were, but quite a lot longer ago. Um, one of the things that I learned as a way to get the best monitor sound was actually to turn up an hour early for your shift. Well, because, you know, if, you, if you're prepared to put in that extra time, you know, possibly for free if you're getting paid an extra hour, certainly you've got that time to learn about things. And also it means that when people come on stage, they're like, well, actually, this is good. He knows what he's doing. Yeah. And that day starts Confidence. working well for you. Confidence. Yeah. You've got, you yeah. got to provide everyone around you with that confidence. The thing is, you have to walk into a building and change your... By walking into a building or walking into a room, you change the environment around you without saying anything. <sighs> and if you've got that ability, then you're doing something okay. Um, and as long as that ability is something positive then you're doing something okay. It can be something negative, but you want the positive side of things. Um, so even everyone has bad days, but essentially that's the method that you want to have is anyone, when you see your face, I know what I'm going to get. Yeah. Uh, and, that, and that's the confidence that people want to see in, in, in you. Um, and quite often you bump into the same people on tour and in festivals and you, you want it to be so that when they see your face, they're, they're happy as well. Okay. Now I'm going to move on a little bit because one of the things that I did want to cover was a bit more of the technical stuff. And one of the reasons we've got such a strong relationship with you is because of your, your use of Soundcraft consoles, which I just okay. want to sort of touch on a little bit. And so you've been using that format for you know, since I first met you. Uh, can you just go over a couple of things about why why you've fallen in love with that one particularly? I, well, I started, I saw Soundcraft in college with The Ghost. Um, okay. I used that in college. Then I did a conference where I saw an engineer that I, I like called Pablo using a Soundcraft console. I think it's a bigger version of The Ghost, more the live version of The Ghost. I think it's mm-hmm. a spirit. Um, and then 
uh, work doing Tiny's tour, we had VI sixes. Me and Nick Home had VI sixes. Yeah. Um, and from then, it was that was the first digital console that I not used, but of the Soundcraft region, um, and it was magical to me. It was an analog board in a digital domain. Yeah. I touched, it reacted, I pushed, I heard, and that's all I needed. And and to the point of, like, you could whiz around it. Two people could be on a console at the same time yeah. without connecting with each other. So the workflow for me was was just beautiful. It just, it just flowed together. Um, and... And especially in some of the shows that we had, we didn't have much time to soundtrack or set up and stuff like that. So I could technically do a mix uh, and then copy and paste it, tweak it to that person and then go, guys, listen, check. Cool. Next. Okay. Let me deal with the artist now. Uh, all right, cool. Soundcheck for however long. And then during that, we just tweak it. And by the end of soundcheck, we're like, cool. We are right there. We can do the gig now. So that, yeah. that, that progressed in, 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 t- in terms of with the console. Now, there's other consoles that can do that, but the Soundcraft cons- console is just magical from in, in my, in, with the fingers. Um, and the sound of it, that you can drive it without, without it crunching. Um, I, so, I, I completely agree. I and mean, it's one of the things that I did in the role before Harmon. I bought a lot of consoles for the company that I was working for and I chose the VIs because of that thing you're saying again, you've got that sort of speed and instant response from it. It's a, it's a good one for, you know, doing that thing that you would do on an analog thing, doing monitors where you're having to think about the whole world at the same time. And the VI will make it easy for you to get on with the mixing. Most definitely. And, and in to a point of, um, even, can I, can I go into uh, doing both, both ends of the stick? You can, uh, yes. So it's like doing both ends of the sticks means front of house and monitors at the same time. Yes, um, okay. Makes it liquid. And I, I, I'm, because I'm on the younger generation um, of, well, I was on the later end of the analog consoles on the early end of the mm-hmm. digital consoles. I never really mix with pots. Uh, I have mixed with pots a few times, but my mixing was always one flip on faders. So I was mm-hmm. did up on faders. Um, and being the, having the ability to do that quickly and mix between ears and monit- front of house and monitors uh, has always been my, I could call it my secret weapon because I, I've ended up doing a lot of shows where it becomes front of house monitors. Uh, well, in fact, that was where probably one of the first shows that we worked together on. Obviously, we'd met sort of earlier on, but when you came to Iceland with one of yeah. the earlier Stormzy shows, yeah. and so Stormzy was headlining, and so it's a festival that I, I work on in Iceland. And as the headline artist, for you to come up and say, right, I am doing monitors from front of house. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, so, are you really? But you were. And again, it was like seeing that work ethic where you set yourself up here and now you're down at the other end of the stage checking the RF stuff, etc. Yeah. So, uh, and that's, that's me doing, having, having that principle of learning and understanding every single point of the chain. It's not just hand me a microphone, check the front of the house, and here you go. Thank you very much. Yeah. But it's making sure that the ears, the side fills, the front of the house are all working together because if any of those are conflicting with each other, then number one, I can't get, I can't deliver the show that I, I need to deliver, and my artist can't perform the way he needs to perform. So what we end up doing with Stormzy is. Um, on from his 2007 17 tour, um, we decided to do monitors for front of house. Number one, we couldn't find the monitor person that he was happy with, mm-hmm. um, and technically, me being selfish, I wanted to do front of house. Um, so I was like, the only way for me to do both, or for me to get my happiness, is yeah. to do both. So we end up touring the the world, the globe, in that format, and 
especially having to go to Iceland and setting up front of house. And I used to always set it up in terms of having um, a monitor section and a front of house section. Um, and then from my, from, my, from my setup point of view, I'll always sort the ears out, make sure the ears are fine because the ears are the most important thing to me, the house I can make happen. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah. um, then we'll check the, check the house, make sure the PA is good, make sure the PA is tuned. And because the, the system that we was using was good because the VXT system, the VXX yeah. that we was using, um, I just flashed the, the music in the PA, did some vocals, and I was like, oh, we're, we're good here. Um, and then I always do sound check by myself. So I make sure that the stage is prepped with the ears, the microphones and stuff like that, ready for when the tour manager comes on stage, ready to pack up storms. Um, and then we'll do a, a, a line check, sound check backstage silently. And, and because I'm doing everything, I can manage that workflow. So there's house music going on. The house is off, but he's having his own show concert backstage. And I go, you good? Yeah, we're good. All right, let's go. So then we will always start the show. And the first thing that I always, my knees are always buckling before a show. I have to say that. Whether it's front of house or whether it's monitors, it's always buckling before a show. Sometimes if you're not feeling that fear, you're getting a little bit too cocky. Way too cocky. Yeah, that fear is important. (laughs) (laughs) My my knees slightly, I I can't tell anybody, but my knees are slightly And the first thing that I hear, obviously the music starts, the intro starts with the storm and all the rest of it. But we always, um, it was first things first was the first song. And all I needed to hear was first. And that's all I needed to hear was the first lyric. And I knew that his vocal was in front. Any changes that I needed to make in the first 10 seconds, I could make it um, to make the show comfortable. And then I would always quickly reference his ears um, make sure that he's got the ambience so he can hear the crowd. So be able to have the ability to think about monitors and do front of house at the same time is pressure. And I did put that pressure on myself. Yeah. But I know the results that I wanted to get for him and for me. Um, and so talking about the, one of the reasons he made that decision was because while we've obviously spoken about the importance of the monitor position and how highly skilled it is, yes. mixing on a big system is something that you enjoy. And so to be able to get that. Um, and so talk, talk about that for a sort of couple of minutes. And that, that sort of feeling where your knees are buckling a little bit and then it sort of starts coming into shape at that volume. Well, it's, it's, there's, nothing, there's nothing like something that you've been working on for a time in private or during sound check. And now the arena, the space that you're in yeah. is full and compact, full of people cheering, chattering, and you give them the first imp- impact of sound, which is the music. They all start, the lights go down and it's like, okay, we're started. You hear the fog horns, you can do the sound and everyone's like, oh, what's going to happen here? When's he coming out? Where's he coming from? And because he doesn't come out shouting, he comes out speaking. So that speech yeah. has to be over anything that's happening. So as well as you want to give a musical impact, you need to give a vocal impact. And my, my, my thought on my process has to be, the vocal has to be clean. Yeah. Um, and even though the music that Stormzy does is grime and a lot of grime is and you can't understand anything that they say most of the time. Like Stormzy is the person that you can speak to and like say, Storms, don't hold the microphone like that, please. Hold it like this because you'll get this kind of result. Oh, he's a great performer. Um, oh yeah. And, and his, yeah. His, his vocal his vocal power translates in, in, in whatever he, whatever I receive and whatever I put out. So it's like sometimes they do slip up and uh, they do slip up and pick up the microphone. But that's the reason why I technically, I, put, I'm, I may be the only engineer that has an active talk, talk microphone in an artist's ear during the show. Yeah. But I will always, during the show, go, microphone, stop cupping. And then he'll just change his posture. 
And that's that, you know, you've built up that relationship with him. That have, yeah. Uh, which comes um, from the time that you've learned about being a monitor engineer. Most definitely. Now, quickly, the the show that has obviously been on a lot of the um, advertising for this is the Glastonbury show. And so for those of you that aren't familiar, um, Glastonbury is certainly the biggest fit festival in the UK. It's one of the first festivals it was just about to celebrate its 50th year mm. and the pyramid stage is one of the most iconic stages in the world and mm. it's it's an impressive beast to see now so what is it like when you're working on that and you're walking in and going right this is the office for the day um walking into the pyramid stage the night before yeah being that stage walking on the stage number one i thought it's not that big <laughs> and then walking over to the to the tent a matter of fact this was the first time i've done front of house at on the pyramid stage mm-hmm. um i've i've done monitors before on from the on from yeah. the pyramid stage but it's the first time i've done front of house from the pyramid stage and obviously it was my first um uh, headline show on the pyramid stage um, which was if if I allow that pressure to get to me, I don't think I would have been able to deliver what I needed to deliver. Yeah. So the only way you sort of I need to put the blinkers on a little put bit. The blinkers on <laughs> and just stay focused. And in in and we and the thing is that we did a lot of preparation in terms of rehearsals, um, working and building that show, um, and, and my. My previous um, talk that I did, I said I didn't use snapshots. Oh, I don't use snapshots. Mm -hmm. It was all freehand and liquid and all the rest of it. But for this show, snapshots was heavily used. Um, and, And that was mainly because of the different dynamics that were coming into play between having a, uh, technically a 48 channel band and mm-hmm. 12 vocals, live vocals, and a choir of 50 spread across the stage. And, um, and, then, and then all the other different acts that were, were guest, guest artists that were coming through. Um, and then, so realistically, I stretched the console that I was using um, and used it to the best of its ability. Like, yeah. I, I even to the point of we had a secondary console, which was there for redundancy, but I knew that the console wasn't going to be failing on me, so I used it for expansion realistically. Okay. So um, that's good to hear. Yeah, it's like I, I, it's, it's been it's, it's it's part of my rib basically. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like we yeah the console the console did does good for me all the time. So having an extra console was just extra fingers, extra spread room between the 12 BVs and the band and having Stormzy still having active space around. Um, and then between the snapshots, we use the snapshots to um, change inputs. So, yeah, so between um, Coplay, Chris Martin, Chris Martin coming to um, guest with us, um, he used his own system. Um, right. We flipped inputs, and the system just did it liquidly, and then we could switch back without using extra channels. So we have guest lines, and then so instead of using extra guest lines, we just switch the inputs in in the snapshot for that particular song. Um, and being on that st- being in that arena on that stage, having that 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 amount of power in my hands. And also, me having that pressure of delivering or translating what those guys were doing on stage to mm-hmm. that mass audience, now I see that is pressure. <laughs> yes. I, like, I watched it on TV and it, it was a great show, really quite special. So um, yeah, it, was a, it, was a gr- it was a great deliverance from the team. And especially, and the thing is, as, as I says, I'm only the engineer, but I can't do my job without the monitor engineer person that I had in play mm-hmm. um, and my um, system tech person 
um, they they were they were helping hands. The RF techs, the they were all amazing people that had to come together um, to make that show happen. And and even to a point like me saying in the early days, or me I me having to know know every stage of the system, which I still want to know, even at front mm-hmm. of house. I have to rely on the people around me to deliver what they need to deliver. And that's, uh, that's having a good team around you. Yeah. And so it's good when you have a good team around you. It, it's a lot about that relationship thing. Yeah. Now going to move on to the last gig that we worked together on, which was the theatre show that we did down in Kingston. Yeah, Rose Theatre. That's right. So that yeah, the Rose Theatre. So a a very much smaller venue from the Pyramid Stage, and we're looking at sort of like one thousand two hundred or so. And so maybe maybe not even that. Maybe let's let's go smaller. Let's go eight hundred. Oh, seven hundred. Seven hundred. Yeah, so slow. We'll just pick a number, make it up. Um, the answer's probably on the internet somewhere. Um, nice theatre, three balconies, and so you'd come in to speak to. Harmon and JBL about working with you on a PA for that and so I got involved and did the show for you on a small VTX A8 system yeah. which you know lots of you on the call will know about those of you that don't know about go and listen to it it sounds amazing um, and so your impressions of using that system and I, I remember being very happy with it can you just give a couple of comments on that yeah that 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 system Number one, I asked the question very late in the day. It could have been two or three days beforehand. I went, "Can I have a? Can I? Can I get a system, please?" Yeah, this company can hire a system from them. We will come and support you. Cool. It happened. It arrived, yeah. and even down to the system configuration of it, um, we had like um, three um, eights in the in the air, and three on the ground with three subs. Um, on the ground and just the the sheer width that the system was throwing at was yeah the, the coverage in the room and bear in mind it's a theater that normally has um three tiers of balconies and it has little pocket holes and normally in theater systems you normally have 10 speakers in different areas to cover the different pocket holes we had technically four stacks a yeah. ground stack and a flown yeah, stack. Yeah, ground stack and a flown system. Yeah, I had to cover the whole room. And we have images of uh, Stormzy performing technically in line with the stack yeah. at the level that we were running at, and it never blinked. Um, and it was so beautiful. It was so warm. It was so... Yeah. It, was, it was unbelievably transparent. Um, and to the point of, like, we did... We did two shows a night. We did two, two days and two shows a night. Um, it really felt like a theatre production. Um, yeah. it, was something for, it was something for the fans. Um, and we, we, we said that uh, it may not happen ever again, but it, was, it is something beautiful that happened that, those two nights. Uh, and anybody that was there understood and felt that emotion the connection and even to be that close to Stormzy and feel the impact of the show sing the sing-alongs the um the energy of of everything that was around and technically the way that building was felt like the Glastonbury set yeah I mean <laughs> certainly I you know kind of doing having done Stormzy in a big show and then doing it in that theater show you got that level of detail and that you know sort of intimacy yeah. Um, but I think you're also getting that high, high quality sound from that PA, and that was a, that was a good couple of nights. Now, <laughs> it then just leads me on to what I think is going to be our our last topic that I've got on on my list, which is how the current situation that we're in is affecting the events industry, and obviously yeah. a lot of you and I friends are. Um, attending sort of a demo tomorrow and it's really sort of affected that rental industry now the comment about the theater show that we did there was it was running two sittings a night yeah because it was a small thing it was for the fans now in that way a venue can get 
you know, that footfall, that ticket sales that it needs. Yeah. And so that was a, a great example of it. And have you got any other feelings or things that you're thinking about for, you know, where we go over the next few months? Yeah, well, it, it's difficult because we, we all like music. We all like festivals. Mm-hmm. We all like mass gatherings in terms of socialization. But because of the situation that we're in right now, that is impossible difficult to manage and handle so if we can't do the arenas um whatever size venues we can do like what we did in um in in january um having multiple nights in a smaller venue and make it into like a niche kind of festival so using all the different theaters around and supporting uh, those those niche markets um, mm-hmm. do live shows, so you could do a week a week festival of different artists, and alternatively one at one at one o'clock, one at seven o'clock, or one at three o'clock, and just keep rotating the artists around the same night, and that could happen for a week. Mm-hmm. Um, that will help that particular venue around. And that could be a venue in any country or any city. Um, the only difficult part is, is that the quantity of numbers that it would be allowed. Um, because even though certain artists can go and do arenas or can go and do a stadium, um, from a cost-effective point of view, it may be cost-effective to just do one show or, and get that amount of people in, or mm-hmm. it may be more cost-effective doing a smaller show for a longer period it might might take up more of your time than one stadium show or one arena show but you're still serving the fans you're still serving the people and you're still providing jobs for the environment yeah and it might be that it's something that you have to look at doing for the next six months not necessarily forever but i thought no that no, the, no no the, we will the get example, back to the big rooms yeah but the example of doing, yeah, you know, sort of Stormzy in this small theatre, the, yeah, you know, hopefully other artists will be looking at it because certainly the experience was great for everyone working on it when you're getting those small, you know, smaller venues working with the, the bigger artists and the bigger songs. It's, it's a big deal. Most definitely. Most definitely. And, it, and exactly the same way from a technical point of view, we want to deliver the best show for the artists the artist wants to deliver the best show for the, their fans. So if, if it is a personal, intimate show, depending on who the artist is, like even with the Stormzy um, show at the Rose, that set list was completely different than what we do in a bigger show. Yeah. It wasn't headbanging and it wasn't crazy. It was more the lovey-dovey, softer side of things. So mm-hmm. even with those dynamics, because there was kids there and it was more family orientated, the dynamics were slightly different. So depending on the genre of music, will cater for the, the audience that you need. Yeah. Okay, right. I'm just going to take a look at a couple of the questions that we've got in the Q&A bit. So I can just sort of jump, um, jump it a little bit. So... One question that we've had twice out of all the front of house mixing consoles available, which one is your favorite? I think we've pretty definitely answered that one, haven't we, Raf? Yeah, it's Soundcraft. It's the Soundcraft <laughs> VI. Um, and I'm on yes, a VI 2000. Yeah, um, and I, I, I've got a deep affection for all of the VI consoles as well, so yes. Now, a couple more um, questions along the same line. So... As younger engineers, how do you um, suggest people to do this and get recognition for it? Now, I think that part of the thing that we can take from the chat that we've had is it's not just about your technical skills, is it? It's about a whole load of other things. Now, the the technical skills is, I would call it the last on the list because I've I've always says to get a job, sometimes it's who you know, but to keep the job, it's who you are. Yes. Oh, that's good. I like that. Um, Certainly, I've always thought when I'm employing people, I can teach technical skills. I can't teach personality. Exactly. Yeah. So we have to sort of look at that. So, you know, to to those people that asked that question, I think that's key bit. Now, question asking about 
poor mic technique from vocalists and what would you do with that and i think you know maybe part of it is the way to deal with it is to deal with it beforehand um yeah it's 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 down to training like there's there's a number of um like poor technique is down to they just not they just don't know and they're just used to doing certain you do it using a microphone in a certain way and uh, if I go with a singer, a singer could hold the microphone halfway down to their chest and whisper, um, which is not going to help anybody's situation. Um, and or you come and do sound check, and you go, hab, 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 "Tear me up!" And then when it comes to the show, you start shouting. That's not going to help anybody's situation. So it's just it's just coaching and schooling the artist that you're with um, to use the microphone properly and and because i work with a lot of rap artists there's there's some rap artists that i've had clashes with and it's worked and it hasn't and it, some of them that hasn't like um like one in particular i asked can you not cup the microphone and i got told i'm a professional i've been doing this for 10 years and i was like well that's cool but to get you a better show if you do it yeah. this way you should do it this and like we had friction but he has never forgot my name and he, I think he respects me and I respect his work and his, his role and all the rest of it. So, but we had a good show that night, either way. Um, and then there's, um, artists that like on our last tour that we just come off the, our European tour, we had um, a support artist called JK and he cut the, cut the microphone so much times and he wasn't my artist and I wasn't looking after him but I, I left it two shows and I left it two shows too long right. and I ended up going to him and I went do you care about your show? He went what do you mean? And I was like because the way that you're holding your microphone no one can understand anything that you're saying so if you hold the microphone properly you'll get a better reaction from your crowd and especially being in Europe and you've got a language barrier mm-hmm. to help, you, help yourself out as much as possible. So after that show, he was more conscious on holding the microphone properly. And number one, I try not to get into people's space, but I also want the best for people. And, and also for, for me being the headline engineer, I shouldn't need to speak to that person. But Stormzy, as my artist has brought that artist to support him for a reason. So me as Storms' engineer needs to get the best from every single part of that performance. So every every support artist needs to get the same respect that I give my headline artist. Because there'll be one day that I will be on the headline slot and I'll be doing a support slot and I will want that same respect. So it's not down to I'm the big boy now and, and I don't care about anybody else, but it's showing that same level of respect. And it's happened to me a number of times. Like we've happened in the early days with Tiny and um, we, had, um, we, had a, we had an artist come through. We looked after him. And then a few years later, we were supporting Drake. And that same engineer was Drake's engineer. And he was like, oh, whatever he wants, give it to him. Don't question him, do whatever he wants. So from me giving him respect, he gave me respect. And the industry is way too small for people not to respect each other because yes. it's going to come around at some point. Okay. Um, I, you know, I think that that's been the underlying thing that we are um, learning from this. Now I've got a couple more questions where someone asking about time aligning monitors to front of house now i think that could get quite technical and we could end up down a rabbit hole on that but have you got any couple of sort of thoughts on that quickly yeah well an an old school engineer which is the my famous person called pablo always 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 told me that that they both have to work together yeah and if they don't work together they're working against each other so it's it's in a sense of it's always 
to the point of monitors will always be effective. So the monitor engineer will always be turning up the wedges, turning up the wedges, and it's not helping because of the reflections of the front of house. Yeah. And my, um, he always told me to delay the front of house back to the monitors because it won't be affected. It won't, well, obviously, it's not affecting the public. That, 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 yeah, and that's, that's the thing. You can't really be messing around with time alignment on the monitors themselves because... No. That is that is your artist's reproduction, yes. and that that time is crucial to them. Um, so a, you always to delay the front of house back to whatever yeah. measurement you you calculate, and you will hear the difference between the front of house and monitors. And you know, it, if if anything, so that it's clearing up the monitor, the stage sound more than anything else. Yeah, and it, it should never be a battle between the monitors and front of house they always should be working in line with each other because yeah. essentially they want to both get the same result. Okay. Now, last question, someone asking Alok from Masterpiece has asked about how important do we think that good system techs and in turn the production company staff are when delivering a successful show. And again, I think that everyone in the room is important and you have to have to give them the respect everyone everyone in the room is important everyone plays the part even down to like the system tech is great but the person that puts the barrier up is yeah. great too because when the crowd goes crazy and starts pushing that barrier you want to be safe. To, yeah they need to put that <laughs> barrier up right you want so, someone who knows what they're doing with that most definitely so it's like the system tech is will make my job easier as the front of house engineer to deliver the result that i want to get um, in terms of when I mix, I want it to translate as transparently as possible to the PA. Um, and even down to the road is the local crew. The local crew, I have to respect every single local crew out there because the graft and the work that they put in before the show and after the show is unbelievable. So every chain of the industry needs to be uh, not idolized, but respected. Yeah. Okay, well, I think we've come to the end of that. Um, and certainly I've enjoyed chatting with you about that and certainly learning some of your um, approaches to work. Uh, I think we're coming to the end of questions as well. Though, if anyone ever wants to sort of get in touch with anyone in Harmon, then feel free and we can pass information between us and Raf and hopefully um, do another one of these soon. Um, I'll bring you back to Laura. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks so much, guys. That was a really great presentation. Um, and just as a reminder, this was recorded. So if anybody has interest in reviewing it again or passing it on to a teammate or friend, um, we'll have that up on our uh, YouTube channel in about three days. And if you'd like to check out any of our future sessions, we do have quite a few coming up for audio. Go out to pro.harman.com and you can see the full calendar of sessions. So thanks for your time today. We always appreciate you attending. And Ed and Raphael, thank you so much for presenting. Yeah, have and I'm seeing a couple of chat, a couple of replies from people who have on the call. So it looks like everyone enjoyed it, Raph. Uh, a lot of love for you well, there. So. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. Yeah. Um, okay, well, everyone who's on the call, have a wonderful rest of the day. <laughs> Thank you. Take care, guys. <laughs>